In March 1944, scientists working at Los Alamos in New Mexico took a break to crack open the latest issue of Astounding Science Fiction magazine. Featured in the issue was Deadline, a short story by author Cleve Carmel. Set on the planet Kaysor, a barely disguised version of Earth, the story told of a war between two races, the Sixer and the Sea. Yabor, a Sixer agent, is dispatched on a secret mission behind enemy lines to assassinate Dr. Citric, a sealer scientist who developed a terrible new weapon that threatens to destroy the entire planet. Shortly after landing, Yabor is captured by an underground Sixer resistance group who proceed to interrogate him to confirm his identity. So far, so cliché. But as Yabor begins to describe the terrible weapon he has been sent to destroy, the Los Alamos scientists began to feel an uneasy twinge of familiarity. Have you heard of U-235? It's an isotope of uranium U-235 has been separated into quantity easily sufficient for preliminary atomic power research and the like. They got it out of uranium ores by new atomic isotope separation methods. Now they have quantities measured in pounds. But they have not brought the whole amount together or any major portion of it, because they are not all that sure that once started it would stop before all of it has been consumed in something like a micro-microsecond of time. Set off on an island, it might lay waste to an entire island, uprooting trees, killing all animal life, but even that 50,000 tons of TNT wouldn't seriously disturb the really unimaginable tonnage which even a small island represents, but the surrounding matter unable to maintain a self-supporting atomic explosion normally might be hyper-stimulated to atomic explosion under U-235's forces and in the immediate neighborhood release its energy too. That is, the explosion would not involve only one pound of U-235, but also five for 50 or 500 tons of other matter. Such an explosion would be serious. It would blow an island or a hunk of a continent right off the planet. It would shake Cathor from pole to pole, cause earthquakes violent enough to do serious damage on the other side of the planet, and utterly destroy everything within at least 1,000 miles of the site of the explosion. And I mean everything. Later in the story, Yabor confronts Dr. Citric in his laboratory, and the inner workings of the weapon itself are described in detail. Two cast iron hemispheres clamped over the orange segments of cadmium alloy, and the fuse is a tiny can of cadmium alloy containing a speck of radium in a beryllium holder and a small explosive powerful enough to shatter the cadmium walls. Then the powdered uranium oxide runs together in the central cavity. The radium shoots neutrons into this mass, and the U-235 takes over from there. The Los Alamos scientists were stunned, for the story described in uncanny detail the work in which they were themselves engaged, a top-secret wartime effort to develop a real atomic bomb codenamed the Manhattan Project. But it was not Cartmel's general description of the weapon which unnerved the scientists. After all, the idea of a bomb based on atomic energy had existed since the discovery of radioactivity in the late 19th century. First appearing in H. G. Wells's 1914 novel The World Set Free, atomic bombs also featured in Donald Wandry's 1934 story Colossus and Robert Heinlein's 1941 story, Solution Unsatisfactory. Rather, it was the specific details of Cartmill's story which rang alarm bells. The first atomic bomb design did indeed use highly enriched uranium-235 as fuel, separated from uranium ore at a secret site in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. However, the available separation techniques proved so slow and cumbersome that the Manhattan Project quickly switched to focus on the element plutonium, which could be generated more efficiently and in larger quantities in nuclear reactors. Nonetheless, by the end of the war, sufficient U-235 had been enriched to permit the construction of Little Boy, the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. More disturbing was Carmel's description of the bomb's fuse, which bore an uncanny resemblance to the neutron initiator, or urchin, used in the very first atomic bomb, codenamed Trinity, or the Gadget. As in Carmel's story, the urchin consisted of a small, marble-sized capsule composed of beryllium and a radioactive element, although the real version used polonium instead of radium. The urchin was placed at the very center of the bomb's plutonium core. When the bomb detonated, the urchin was compressed, mixing the beryllium and polonium and creating a burst of neutrons that set off a chain reaction in the plutonium. Carmel's use of cadmium was also perceptive, as cadmium is a powerful neutron absorber widely used in the control rods of nuclear reactors. And while the notion of an atomic bomb igniting the Earth and setting off a gargantuan secondary explosion might seem ridiculous today, in 
1945, this was actually a very real concern. In 1942, Hungarian physicist Edward Teller, later known as the father of the hydrogen bomb, theorized that the extreme heat of an atomic explosion could fuse hydrogen and nitrogen in the air, igniting the atmosphere and setting off a self-propagating chain reaction that would engulf the entire planet. This possibly so disturbed Teller's colleagues that fellow physicist Arthur Compton told Manhattan Project director J. Robert Oppenheimer that if there was even the slightest chance of this ultimate catastrophe occurring, all work on atomic bombs should stop. In response, Oppenheimer asked Teller and colleague Emil Konopinski to investigate the problem. Thankfully for the scientists, the pair concluded that energy loss via radiation would always outstrip energy production, making a sustained fusion reaction in the atmosphere impossible. The first atomic bomb test thus proceeded as scheduled on July the 16th, 1945, though reportedly some scientists still place bets on whether the atmosphere would ignite. Just how those who bet on it happening plan to spend their winnings after the Earth was vaporized does remain a mystery. Though Cartmel's description of the bombs was far off in many areas, for example, real atomic bombs use a considerable amount of explosive to compress the core to critical mass, the details he did get right were alarming enough to warrant investigation by the Manhattan Project's Intelligence and Security Division, or ISD. The investigation was headed by Captain B. W. Menk, who dispatched counterintelligence corps agent Arthur C. Riley to New York to investigate John Campbell, the editor of Astounding Science Fiction. Campbell, who Riley described in his reports as an egotist, took full credit for the premise and technical content of Cartmill's story, claiming that he had supplied Cartmill with a full summary of the fictional bomb's workings. According to Riley, he tries to make astonishing appeal to those of a scientific mind, and to do so, edits and suggests usually technically correct and sound material. He is one who is always looking for a story regarding technical and scientific matters or projects which have some basis in fact in order to impart his coloration to them when frequently they are the items of work on which many of his technically minded intimates and associates are working. However, Campbell denied having access to privileged information on nuclear physics, insisting that he had simply drawn upon his own experience working at MIT and publicly available technical sources. But Riley was not convinced, and shortly thereafter, a confidential informant revealed that Campbell had been having lunch with one Edgar R. Norton, a technician at Bell Laboratories. Though Norton's work at Bell was unrelated to the Manhattan Project, Riley speculated that he may have acquired information about the atomic bomb from friends working at the nearby Murray Hill District Headquarters, which dealt with uranium enrichment and processing. When questioned, Norton admitted that he had discussed deadline with Campbell, but found it to be an amateurish and childish work. He was particularly derisive of the clunky literary devices Campbell had insisted Cartman include, such as anagrams of Axis and allies of the fictional warring factions, and giving the characters monkey-like prehensile tails to add a veneer of alienness to the story. But just like Campbell, Norton insisted that all the technical information in the story was openly available from public sources. Further investigations soon turned up a new suspect, Will Jenkins, who had been present at Campbell and Norton's lunch. Jenkins had formerly been employed by the Office of War Information, but was forced to resign after being denied security clearance for undisclosed reasons. Intriguingly, he was also an aspiring science fiction author whose short story, Four Ships, had been censored by the Navy for containing too much sensitive technical information. Casting his net even wider, Riley discovered connections between Jenkins and no less than three famous science fiction authors with technical and military backgrounds, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Sprague Kamp. However, despite extensive digging, Riley was unable to uncover any definitive evidence of a security leak. Meanwhile, Special Agent R.S. Killow of the Manhattan ISD's Berkeley office had been investigating Cleve Cartman himself at his home in California. In addition to intercepting Cartmill's mail and questioning close contacts like letter carrier Stuart Hoffman, Kilau combed through the files of military intelligence, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the FBI, and local police looking for any history of suspicious behavior. But other than an incident in which Cartmill's father had attempted to sell a machine gun designed to the Japanese after being turned down by the War Department, he found nothing. Kilau thus proceeded to interview Cartmill under false pretenses. Contradicting Campbell's account, Cartmill insisted that aside from the alien setting, which Campbell insisted on in order to get around wartime censorship, the premise of the story was entirely his own, the technical details being drawn from his own general knowledge of physics. Shortly after moving to Los Angeles in 1927, Carmel explained that he had worked for the American Radium Products Company, where he had picked up the basics of radioactivity and nuclear energy. According to Killau's final report, the information came from general reading and his own scattered knowledge of physics. He had done no particular research for the story, and felt that probably most of his idea for it came from reading various similar stories in magazines of the same type. He stated that no one individual or group of individuals had given him any scientific facts for the story.
story. In conclusion, he made the statements that he thought that most anyone who had read a physics textbook would have the facts available. Later, when directly interviewed by special agent D.L. Johnson, Carmill contradicted his own story by producing correspondence between himself and Campbell. The letters revealed that Campbell had indeed provided a detailed technical summary of the fictional bomb which Carmel had copied almost verbatim. Nonetheless, Johnson was forced to conclude the information contained in the story may have been the results of the imagination of Cartmel and Campbell together with such information as was published prior to 1941. The employment of certain specific material may have been coincidental. While the investigation failed to uncover any security leaks, the incident sent shockwaves through the military intelligence community. Particularly unnerved was Colonel W.B. Parsons of the Manhattan ISD's Oak Ridge office, who issued an urgent memo recommending that both Campbell and Street and Smith, the publishers of astounding science fiction, be firmly reminded that any mention of uranium or atomic energy was a violation of the voluntary censorship code. He even went so far as to suggest that all science fiction publications be banned for the duration of the war, writing, Would it be possible to enlist the cooperation of postal authorities to revoke mailing privileges of such publication in the interest of aiding national defense by refusal to assist in the circulation of information which may innocently furnish assistance to the enemy? Parsons was concerned not only by the potential leaking of technical information to the public or the enemy. Indeed, Campbell agreed to suppress the Swedish edition of the magazine to prevent the Germans from reading it, but also to work of the Manhattan Project itself. Internal security was based in compartmentalization, wherein few of the project's 130,000 scientists, technicians, administrative staff, and other personnel knew the full scope of the work they were performing or even what was going on in the office next door. According to Parsons, the danger of stories like Carmel's was that they could give low-level personnel a big-picture view of their work, leading to, in his words, an undue amount of speculation. Given this extreme paranoia, it is perhaps understandable that John Campbell decided decided to keep the one piece of classified information he did know to himself. Based on the fact that a large number of subscribers, many of whom were physicists, had suddenly changed their mailing address to Los Alamos, New Mexico, Campbell concluded that some top-secret government research project must be based there. Ironically, despite the enormous effort the Intelligence and Security Division and the FBI put into uncovering Cartmill and Campbell's sources, they failed to recognize the very real security breach hiding right under their noses. From the very beginning, the Manhattan Project had been infiltrated by personnel sympathetic to the Soviet Union, such as physicist Klaus Fuchs, chemist Harry Gold, and machinist David Greenglass. These insiders passed atomic secrets to Moscow via an extensive network of Soviet agents and couriers, including Greenglass's sister and brother-in-law, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, later convicted of espionage and executed in 1951. This information allowed the Soviet Union to test their first atomic bomb on August 29, 1949, some five years ahead of Western predictions. But it hardly took a sophisticated spiring for atomic secrets to leak out. In one bizarre incident in August 1945, the mysterious fogging of a batch of photographic film led to a scientist from Kodak to accidentally discover the existence of Trinity, the first atomic bomb test. Though the Manhattan Project was among the most closely guarded undertakings of the entire war, despite the US government's best efforts, the secret of the atomic bomb did not stay secret for very long. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, Thank you for watching.